My name's John. I'm an addict. I'll tell you, the last time I used one of these was uh, back in the summer. I was going to meet and uh, I was standing on an old wooden stage near the water. I was holding a microphone. Uh, my, I had shorts on. Mosquitoes was biting the shit out of me. I didn't know if I was supposed to be sharing a Narcotics Anonymous meeting or singing a Tom Jones song. <laughs> I was thinking earlier, uh, years ago, I, you know, it's a program of change, that's what they say. Of course, when I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I didn't understand that. I was just like Arabella, so I thought I just had a drug problem. You know, um, I got here. Somewhere along the line, the literature talks about experiencing a transformation that certainly happened to me. And one day I was reading in the sixth step and it works how and why, and there's a passage in there that says, finding someone we can emulate. Deb, right? And, and when I read that with multiple years clean, I, I automatically, I, I immediately knew, like without any doubt or questioning myself, that that person for me was my grandmother. Because I'm 61 years old, my mother left me uh, uh, in, in 1960. I was a baby. My father took me to my grandmother's house in Southwest Baltimore on Schroeder Street and, and my grandmother raised me. And the reason why it's my grandmother is because when I was a kid in Southwest Baltimore, on Highland Street, near Calhoun Street, they had a mission. It was called Helping Up the Mission, and all the kids in the neighborhood, everybody was poor, nobody knew they was poor, nobody cared that they was poor. And there at the school, all the kids would go up to the mission and they would give us donuts and milk. We just had to sit there and listen to what they had to tell us for 20 minutes. And they would give us the donuts and we could go out in the backyard and they had grass, we could go out and play in the grass. And, and my grandmother also, she taught Sunday school every Sunday to kids. Now I know that like when I read that, and I immediately knew that there was my grandmother that I would like to emulate, when I first came to Narcotics Anonymous, I would have never thought her. See, my grandmother, like my whole life, like she never cussed, she never smoked. If I came in the house and I talked about someone, she'd say, John, we don't do that here, take that outside. You know, in our literature, it talks about living happy, joyous, and free. I never saw my grandmother miserable. All she ever did her whole life was help other people. She worked at this mission for 30 years and never received nothing. Was never paid a dime the entire 30 years that she worked there. Couldn't understand why she did the things she did. When I came here, if I'd have had to answer that question, it would have been John Gotti. <laughs> but thank God, like Lisa said, for the process of Narcotics Anonymous, the step work process, my first sponsor, who was Charlie J, who I love to death. Thank God for him helping me when I got here. The literature says, find someone who believes in us and wants to help us in our recovery. I got high with Charlie J. He used to come around my house after my wife left for a sugar daddy. Before they took the house, he'd come around the house, we'd shoot cocaine, he'd run to the back door and peek out the window, I'd run to the front door and peek out the window. <laughs> we'd peek for 10 minutes and all of a sudden we'd switch. <laughs> he'd run to the back door, I'd run to the front door. I used to peek out the peak hole, the mail slot, or I'd hold a pillow over it because I was afraid someone could look in the mail slot. And who it was I was afraid that would see me was my father because I was so ashamed of who I was. Charlie J used to shoot cocaine. We'd run around on Lombard Street. A guy named Henry used to stand on the mailbox all day long and just look around the neighborhood. <laughs> Being nosy. Charlie'd run out of my house. He'd run down to the mailbox. He'd run around Henry about six times in a circle. <laughs> and run over and sit down on the steps. 
And we'd say, somebody better get him to hell away from me. He ran up his mother's house one time, paranoid from shooting cocaine. He come back down with a German shepherd and a butcher knife. I'm sitting on the bar steps, the side of the steps. He's standing next to the wall with a butcher knife and a German shepherd. This cop in our neighborhood named Stu pulls up and says, John, what's wrong with Charlie? I said, oh, he just shot some cocaine. He said, oh, okay, and pulled off. <laughs> like, I didn't know that, like, Charlie was going to be my sponsor. <laughs> He ran out of my house one day. I lived on Carlton Street near Highlands Market. I come out of the house, I'm looking for him. I look at the house next door. He's trapped between the screen door and the entrance door. And can't get out. The people in the house called the police. When the police come, he was still trapped in the doors. I didn't know Charlie was going to be my sponsor when I got the Narcotics Anonymous. He would disappear. We would stand on the street corners and people would say, anybody seen Charlie? I said, man, somebody said he goes in a meeting or something. He'd be gone for months. Then all of a sudden you'd see Charlie standing on a corner again. Where can I get three dimes? So when I came here, selfish, self-centered, self-seeking, always thinking and believing that my solution was always somebody giving me something. You know, it says in the 12th step, in the step working guide, it says, helping another person is the highest aspiration of the human heart. Mm -hmm. Which means nothing is greater, right, than to help someone else. And when I got here, they told me, I, be, I got clean when I was 36. I've been clean almost 25 years. I always like to say I've been clean once. I haven't relapsed on anything. You can only relapse on drugs in this program. It talks about experiencing spiritual and emotional lapses that lead to relapse. I've had many of that. Thank God I haven't used like, I remember chasing a girl around here for years, and people used to say, how do you not use? How do you not use? And the only thing I could say was that I had a sponsor and I worked steps. The only thing I could say was that I go to meetings every day. The only thing I could say was that I prayed and I asked God to remove the obsession to use. That's the only thing I could say. And so when I came, because I was desperate, Frank, what you laughing at? Because I'm doing something with this thing. <laughs> you look like you're getting excited. <laughs> so what happened was when I, you know, I went to treatment. I'm a veteran from back in the 70s. I was in the Navy. I went to, I've been to treatment one time. I've been to like many uh, detoxes at Bon Secure Hospital only to get out to run home and go get one. But when I get, when I got out, what they told me was, this is what they told me. They said, John, if you want to stay clean, you don't have to, like, go to church. You don't have to move to Montana. You don't have to go home, lock yourself in the room. What you need to do is you need to go to a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. So when I got out on a Thursday, they gave me a schedule. I looked at the schedule. Thursday night was Search for Serenity in Town. Some people here remember, on Washington Boulevard, which was across the bridge from where I lived. And I went to... Went to the meeting, and, and guess who I see? Charlie. Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, like, <laughs> was weighing about 180 pounds, like, uh, looking good. You know, I, I didn't, you know, know anything about what Narcotics Anonymous was. You know, he come up to me, and, and I told him I just got out of treatment, and uh, this is what he told me. He said, I'll pick you up tomorrow for a meeting. I didn't know that people help other people here. I didn't understand the therapeutic value of one addict helping another. 
You know, it talks about the first step and it works how and why. There's a passage that says through our surrender and accepting the fact that we cannot recover on our own, a ray of light shoots through the darkness beginning our spiritual awakening. See, and the darkness is denial. The light is hope. So what it's saying is that when the hope shoots through the darkness, the spiritual awakening begins. The awakening that it talks about in the 12th step doesn't happen in the 12th step. It says that the spiritual awakening happens a bit at a time, and it's a slow and gradual process as a result of working the steps. So what it's saying is that the spiritual awakening that the 12th step talks about can't happen or couldn't happen for me unless I work the 12 steps. And when I got here, I didn't understand that. Look, I believe in exact nature. The fifth step talks about the exact nature of our wrongs. My whole life, like I never knew why I did the things I did. Charlie said to me when I first got here, he said, John, the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous are going to introduce you to you. Like the most important relationship that you need to have is the relationship with yourself. Because I never had that. See, like, I knew when I got clean, I knew Bill Clinton was the president. I knew we won the Second World War. I knew uh, uh, Neil Armstrong was the first man on the moon. I knew the Colts beat the New York Giants in the 1958 World Championship game. But I didn't know a damn thing about me. I remember sitting in the basement on Holland Street as a teenager with friends of mine in the neighborhood, sniffing glue and drinking beer and talking about the things we did, but we never talked about why we did those things. I didn't even know that like all phenomena, everything that exists is driven by something else. Everything you can see, everything you can't see is a direct result of something else pushing that. When I got here to Narcotics Anonymous and I started working the steps as a direct result of the degradation and the dereliction and the distrust of others and the denial, the self-hatred that I brought in here with, the despairing spirit that it talks about, because of those things, that's what drove me to want to work the step. Simple. They said get a pencil and get a book. I can remember going over Broadway to the recovery sh shop on, on Broadway, and they had the old cart, uh, comic book racks, and they had the Hazleton pamphlet booklets in there. And I would go over there, and it was like, it was like $2.25. And back then when we bought it, we bought one step at a time. So I went over there with my sponsor, and I bought step one. I was able to get $2.25 to buy the Hazleton pamphlet because when I got here, I didn't have nothing. I was homeless. When I came to Narcotics Anonymous, I didn't have nowhere to live. Like, I didn't get a, get a car until I had three and a half years clean. Like, my father, who put me out because of my active addiction, let me come back in. So I lived with my father clean in southwest Baltimore for three years. For a long time, I thought like I didn't have anything because I didn't have nothing out of here. Now I realized that I had everything because what I had was a sponsor. And I had a step book. And I prayed. And I knew where the meetings were. And I can remember like leaving my father's house, walking to Christian Street. My friend Aaron used to say it's like walking through the belly of the beast. Like walking straight through the same neighborhoods I used to get high in. With my head down, carrying my book, right? Like trying to get Mickey, my friend Mickey says, going with a purpose. Leaving point A and going to point B. Like knowing that I was leaving there, going to the meeting. Just to get there, just to get another shot of hope that shoots through the darkness that it talks about beginning the spiritual awakening. And so, I work steps. And here's the thing that people don't talk about. They talk about this being a program of change. And what I know is that everything you see out here is only a direct result of what's going on in here.
and that the change that they talk about in this program only takes place in the step work process. And it happens then, because what I realize, denial is a powerful characteristic of the disease of addiction. So if I never had the ability, like Lisa talked about, to see things about myself, if I sit down by myself with a pencil and I'm writing things because I read the question and then I reminisce or I reflect about what it is that the question is asking me and I'm thinking about that, there's the change. There's the change. If I had the ability to see something I never saw before, that's the change. If I sit with my sponsor and we're talking about things and I don't have the ability to see those things and he helps me see it and I accept it for what it is because I have enough humility to see that, that's the change. I'm telling you, for me, I almost want to say that like it ain't been much of a struggle. I think because when I got here, the literature says when the addict's beaten, the addict is willing. And I think when I got here, I was ready. And I worked the steps. I felt like Columbo. You older folks know Columbo. <laughs> Guy only had one eye. <laughs> Saw better than people with two eyes. That's what I felt like because I was seeing things about me. I was starting to understand things. It was exciting. It was like I wanted more. You know, it was like I went home and I wrote. My, my second four step was an old AA four step. It was 270 questions. I still got it. Sitting down and writing and answering all those things and then going to my sponsors and going over those things and being really, thank God the literature says we, we, were, uh, we were happy to find out that we suffer from a disease, not a moral deficiency. Yeah. Like when my sponsor helped me see those things, my whole life all I've ever been is just this scared guy. Like standing out on the street corners, 13 years old, 26 degrees, uh, three inches of snow on the ground, but I couldn't go in because I was afraid that some other kids might come out and they might like go break in a truck or go down to railroad yards and steal some copper. And I was afraid if I didn't go with them the next day when they bought the glue and the Pabst Blue Ribbon beer that like I couldn't drink none with them. I could never like see those things. And so when I came and I worked the steps, this is what I realized. It says in the eighth step, it talks about by now we should be able to understand instead of trying to be understood. I believe for me the eighth step is the program. For me the eighth step ain't about saying I'm sorry and just changing the way I act. It's about learning how to relate to other people differently. See, because they're talking about a program of change. In the fifth step, it talks about sharing our fourth step with someone who has integrity, compassion, and insight. But what I know is that when I came here 25 years ago and admitted that I was a powerless individual, I didn't understand that I would never be powerful enough to be this person that I think I want to be. I don't have that ability. In step six, it talks about vision. Step seven talks about a desire. Somewhere along the line is a result of step work, right? Somewhere along the line, something started taking place with me, right? Where I started becoming someone who started having the ability to understand other people. And the only way that happened for me was when I sat down and I answered questions about myself and my sponsor helped me see those things. That's what allows me to understand others. In other words, I only get better with you by looking at me. See, I got to look at the things that I suffer from in order to understand that you suffer from the same things. That's the process of step work. I only get better with, with me by loving you. I was self and self-centered and self-seeking. Like, here's a very self-centered statement. I wish she would love me. If he would only love me. Listen to that. Listen to how selfish that sounds to want another person to love me. I thought that's what my solution was when I came here. When I got here, I wasn't loving me. See, my sponsor was loving me. 
See, I didn't understand when they talk about keep what you have by giving it away that he was keeping his because he was loving me. I didn't understand that concept when I got here. It was all about what can you do for me? And somewhere along the line, you know, I got a car. Uh, my first car was a uh, fire engine red uh, I rock Z. <laughs> Had T top. <laughs> Bought it from a guy in the neighborhood, $2,800. Had a little job, made about $8 an hour, filed my taxes, claimed my son. He was 10 when I got clean. And I got me an I rock Z. I remember pulling up on Christian Street. This guy said to me, That's your car? I said, Yeah. So you better ride people to the meetings. <laughs> better ride them home after the meeting. I said, why is that? He said, because if you don't, you ain't going to keep it. <laughs> so I, I didn't understand. I didn't know what he meant. You know, I'm in the process. That's what they say. This is a process through the step works. And I'll tell you, let me share something with you about my son. He's 34 years old. Now, he's a hell of a man. Let me tell you. My sponsor a couple years ago, at my anniversary, stood up and said, I want to be like that guy, and pointed at my son in the back. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, he's, he's a good guy, and, and he was 10 when I got clean. And I tell you, I neglected him. I used to come out of my father's house, right, suffer from the need for one more. And I'd see him down on Schroeder Street near Pratt Street throwing a football with all the kids in the neighborhood. And everything in me wanted to go down there and throw that football. But I didn't have the ability because this disease is so powerful. And I hated me because of that. And when I went to treatment, I can remember sitting in there talking about him. Sitting in a circle with these other men down at VA hospital, uh, Stan, where you at? sitting in the VA hospital downtown and uh, crying. And when I got clean, all I wanted was for him to forgive me. Listen to how selfish that sounds. I'm talking about getting to a point of giving back, understanding the truth about why I'm really here. But when I first got here, that's what I needed. I wanted him to forgive me, and I can remember like working my little $6 an hour job, getting paid, and I would take him to the Civic Center to watch the, the bandits hockey game on Friday night. I would walk. That's how close I lived to the Civic Center. We would walk to the Civic Center and walk home. Then Saturday night, I would take him back down there, walk back down there, and watch the blast game. And then Sunday, we would walk to the harbor and get on the paddle boats. And then Monday morning, I'd get up and say, Dad, can I borrow five hours? trying to fix the way I feel, see the need for. Our literature talks about that our spiritual existence isn't dependent upon anything outside of ourselves. Not even my 10-year-old son forgiving me for the things that I did. I need to experience that for myself. Step nine talks about forgiveness. What it is I needed was I needed to experience self-forgiveness. See, no, nobody can do something for me that needs to be done for myself. Or that my son didn't do to me what was done to me, so he can't fix me because of what I did. But I, I chased that. And I remember one morning, Monday morning, my dad said, what the hell, what are you, using drugs again? Because I'm spending all my money trying to fix the way I feel. Thinking and believing that that would fix me. And this is what happened real quick. The first Christmas, I didn't have nothing. Let me, let me reiterate that. <laughs> like, I'll share about that when I talk about sponsorship. I went on West Side Shopping Center. I bought him a Walkman. <laughs> Wasn't no Sony Walkman. It was a Daywa. <laughs> I couldn't afford Japanese. <laughs> Day while I was Korean. <laughs> I 
And I remember Christmas night, his, his mother's mother lived down on the other end of Schroeder Street, and they asked me if I wanted to come down there with my son Eric. And I can remember walking down Schroeder Street, and he had that little day while I plugged in with the earphones, and he talked on me, and he said, Dad, this guy on the radio, kid on the radio just said he's happy because his father goes to these NA meetings and he spends time with him. Now look, 1995, they ain't advertising nothing. I need some help. Somebody help me. <laughs> Who works this thing? <laughs> they didn't look, and, and, I, and I'm thinking for a minute, I'm thinking, wait a minute, they, like I only got like five months clean, I'm thinking, Wait a minute, they, they don't do that on radio, do they? I didn't realize that that was his way of telling me. Because you know why? It says in, in our literature, it says one promise. Promise is freedom from active addiction. But in it works how why it says there's one promise, many freedoms. There's a reason why it says in our literature that a sponsor is someone with work and knowledge of the 12 steps. Because for me, I know I had to experience all these things that the step work did for me in order for me to help someone else. And I loved my sponsor. And I remember like doing step work with him. And I'm telling you, he would pick me up. He would take me to his house. And I can always, always remember telling him, Charlie, thank you. Thank you for helping me, right? And he would always say to me, John, you're welcome, man. He said, it's been a privilege watching you come back to life. Yeah. And I didn't know what he was talking about. What are you talking about? I'm coming back to life. But see, I'm in the process. See what I mean? I don't know that the spiritual awakening has already taken place. I didn't know that because he had a sponsor and he worked steps. And he experienced what it was that the 12 steps does for a member of Narcotics Anonymous. I didn't know that because that happened for him, he had the ability to see it happening to me. I didn't un understand that. <laughs> I don't know how I look with holding on to this thing, but I'm not supposed to just like leave it. <laughs> Elvis Presley. <laughs> Stan was probably listening to Elvis last night. <laughs> I'm in Pam dancing. <laughs> Slow dancing naked in the bedroom. <laughs> but I didn't understand. And somewhere along the line, right, somebody asked me to sponsor them. Now, I probably had worked 16 or 17 steps I probably worked uh, 15 steps before I worked all 12 steps because it was a lot of different stuff. You guys and girls has been around back then, you know. It was different stuff. You just did whatever it was that they had. But I'm here to tell you the step working guy definitely is a lot better than anything they had back then. That's my experience because I've done both. And so a guy asked me to sponsor him. I've I, I never been a sponsor. I came from a place like I never ever thought that I could ever help anybody. He asked me, his name was Doug, he was a big guy. He said, John, can you sponsor me? I said, I, I, I guess so, I mean, I'll try. I, I'm not sure if I know how to do it, but, but I'll try. And, and I remember going up to the recovery house on Wilkins Avenue, right, Frank, up near Dunkin' Donuts. And I sat down with him and we, did, we went over some of the first step. And you know, I left out of there feeling pretty good. And I get back in my car, I go back home. I don't know if I was living in Marl Park County yet by then, but, but I, I go back home and, uh, and, and I, I was feeling pretty good. You know, like I, I just know that every time I did step work with my sponsor, I always felt good. My second sponsor is Dave M. You know, Dave, Dave is more aggressive, but Charlie's more passive. You know, Charlie used to make me cry. Dave makes me want to punch him in the mouth. <laughs> And, and so I leave, I leave, and, and uh, I go home, and the next day I come up Christian Street, and, and I'm sitting on the steps, and he comes up to me. I'm like, what's up, Doug? He says, I used, man. I said, oh, shit, he said, and, and it's your fault. <laughs> 
Now, I know in a 12-step now, it says, although we carry the message, we don't know who will receive it. But because, like, I'm like a rookie sponsor, like, I don't really know how to do it yet. Like, I didn't know if it was the truth or not. I started questioning myself, like, did I tell him something wrong? You know, like going back to Charlie and saying, yeah, Doug Hughes, man, he said it was my fault, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, and Charlie having to help me understand, you know, rationalization, minimization, and justification. So that was my first experience with sponsoring somebody. And so this is what happened for me. I got a house in Morrow Park. The guy said $475 a month. I said, shit, I could probably swing it. Moved my son in with me. His name was Head Chase. He said, look, John, if you pay the rent every month, I'll never raise the rent. Well, I, I guess he didn't know I was going to be there for 12 years. <laughs> when like 10 years clean, he comes to me and says, look, man, I got to raise the rent. <laughs> I didn't know he was going to stay here, you know, because <laughs> I paid the rent every month on time. You know, I'm like, how much you pay to my neighbor? He's like, 800. I'm like, oh shit, I got a deal. I'm gonna make sure I got the 475 every month. And, and, and my father, my father helped me get some furniture. I'm the only kid, never knew my mother to this day. My father was a hell of a man. You know, when he died years ago, he lived with me for two years. I had to take care of him. You know, he, he wore diapers, he couldn't walk. You know, I mean, I had to change his diaper six, seven times a day. Had to help him get to the toilet. I had to wipe his ass when he used the toilet. Because he helped me. You know what I mean? He helped me my whole life. And, and he used to come out to the house. And he would bring food because I had my son there with me. Because his mother was in active addiction. And we went to the used furniture place. Out on Security Boulevard. I don't think I ever been to Security Boulevard in my life. I couldn't get off McHenry Street. We go out there, we get this used furniture, and it was a blue couch and a blue love seat. And I didn't know that like the furniture was getting set up. Like I didn't know that like this was gonna be the spot. Like I had a floor model TV that somebody gave me and it worked for like a month. And then it went up, and I had a 19-inch sitting on top of the floor model. Just like back in the day in Southwest Baltimore, you used this at the TV stand. You didn't get rid of it because it looked good, right? Because I didn't have nothing. Dave used to say, man, you need to get a, you need to get a answering machine because, you know, they had pagers back then. I didn't have none. He'd say, you need to get an answering machine. I'm like, why? It's like, because I keep calling you and you ain't got no answering machine. I remember I said, look, dude, if it's important, you'll call me back. Because I can't afford uh, an answering machine. Like, I'm there by myself, right, me and my son. I don't, like, I ain't got a degree. I, don't, I didn't have a good job. I was just doing the best I could. But once again, I felt like I didn't have nothing. But in true reality, I had everything. Because what happened was, guys started asking me to sponsor them. And I'm going to tell you what. That blue couch and that blue love seat, it got wore out. Because guys came to my house all the time. I started sponsoring people, and once again, something else started happening for me. When they talk about keep what you have by giving it away, I understand because every time I've ever done step work, I've been sponsoring guys for 20 years. Don't take this the wrong way. It used to be a time when I struggled with talking about this, right? Because I would be afraid of what people would think about me saying those things. Because I didn't want it to sound egotistical or grandiose. I'm not looking for self-glorification. See what I mean? I work steps. But I've been helping men in this fellowship for a long time. Like I've sponsored guys that have been clean a long time. And the greatest reward sponsoring other men is when they come back to life. When Charlie said to me, it's been a pleasure watching you, I understand today what he meant because I've had 
I've been able to watch other guys experience the same thing. I've been blessed with that. When I see guys I sponsor who've been clean a long time, when they begin to sponsor other dudes, when other guys come into this program and the guys I sponsor sponsor them and I watch them stay clean and I watch their lives get better. Because see, here's the thing. I've been paid in narcotics analysis. See, I got what it is that I'm supposed to get as a result of the 12 steps. And because I like what that is, it says our gratitude speaks when we care and we share with others the NA way. Gratitude is an action is the direct result of being thankful. And I'm thankful for Charlie J. I'm thankful for Dave M. See, because them guys helped me. And if I'm truly thankful, then that'll be expressed through my gratitude through helping other guys. I'm 61 years old. I work. I work hard. I've worked since I've been here. And sometimes it ain't easy sponsoring 12 guys who want to work steps. See, my only struggle is if there was nine days a week and 32 hours a day, it'd be better. Because if it was, I'd sponsor more guys. Because I enjoy it. You know what I mean, Lydia? I don't struggle knowing that they come to my house. Because I know what it's going to be. When they get up and leave and they look at me and say, thanks, John. Thanks. It makes me feel. The 11 Step talks about finding purpose in life. I raise my kids. I've got a job. I'm a productive member of society. i got a car. I do all those things, right? But I'm talking about can I find it in myself to help a struggling addict stay clean. And they come. It got to a point, man, where like, I couldn't remember nothing. One time, three guys came at nine o'clock because I told all three of them. <laughs> nothing unusual for one guy to come at nine and another dude at 10. And I know that's what keeps me here. My father, years ago, I remember coming out of my house when I started sponsoring people, and he would come out there and it would be, you know, guys out there doing step work. You know, and he'd come back a couple of days later, bring some food, because he always made sure. He did it for my son, not me, but. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I remember one night he said to me, he said, you know what? He said, you remind me of your grandmother. Oh, yes, yes, yes. See, so I'm always saying, <clears throat> somewhere along the line, and here's the thing about me, is like I didn't turn that on. I didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be a sponsor in Narcotics Anonymous. Step six says vision. Step seven talks about desire. And just like I didn't turn it on, what I also know is I can't turn it off. You know, I'll share one story and then shut up. Uh, I sponsored two guys years ago named Joe Miller. You had Happy Joe Miller, and you had Angry Joe Miller. And Happy Joe Miller was from Elk Ridge. Angry Joe Miller was from Holland Street around the corner from where I grew up. He was older than me, and he was a violent guy. He had gunplay in his story. And he fumbled into Narcotics Anonymous, and one day on Christian Street, he asked me if I could sponsor him. And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll sponsor you, Joe. Well, there's a reason why the literature says more will be revealed and keep coming back. You know, even for sponsors. He didn't know that I was like in a relationship at a time with a girl that was using, get clean, using, get clean, using, get clean, using, get clean. You know, she would, she would use and uh, I couldn't let that go. I couldn't like... Let go and let God, whatever that means. Like, and, and, and I struggled. And I used to pray and I'd say, God, if she's using, show me a sign. And I'd wake up the next morning and $40 would be missing. <laughs> but like Lisa talked about, self-deception. You know? And, and so what happened was she got locked up. I came home from work one day. Somebody said, John, they locked Sue up, up on Pratt and Monroe. 
She had a warrant for a shoplifting charge, and uh, and she's over at a woman's detention center in Baltimore City, and uh, I'm talking to her like Thursday, and um, she says, "I'll call you. I'll call you Saturday night." Well, in the meantime, I forgot. Joe asked me to meet him at the Lakeland meeting Saturday night. So then it dawns on me. Sue's calling me, and I gotta meet Joe. The meeting starts at eight. She's calling me at eight. What am I gonna do? <laughs> what am I gonna do? How many of y'all think I waited for the phone call? Raise your hand. How many of y'all think I went and met Joe? Raise your hand. Nah, you're wrong. <laughs> I stayed home. I stayed home and waited for the phone call, talked to her for about 10 minutes. Didn't think a whole lot more about it. Went to bed that night, Sunday morning. My son's down in, I, I, I moved to Morrow Park, right? I used to think Morrow Park was the county. I ain't, I ain't bullshit. I moved out there, they had some grass. I had like a four by four foot patch of grass in front of my house. Laura used to live next to me. She was in the program. I used to play her flowers. <laughs> She'd say, she... and, but my son was down my father's house that weekend. And what happened was that morning I'm laying in bed and I hear, I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, that's, that's the police. <laughs> Knocking like that, right? That's... I'm like, oh, they ain't looking for me. <laughs> They're looking for Sue. So I go downstairs, I open the door. This is a true story. I open the door. It's angry Joe Miller. I'm like, what's up, Joe? He says, can I come in? I said, yeah, come on in. We walk in, walk in the kitchen. He does like this, pulls in his dip, and pulls a pistol out and slams it on the kitchen table. He says, I'm going to tell you, Amafer, if you don't help me, I'm going to kill you and me. Now, I've been shot in 1975 when I was 16 years old. I got shot in the back. I was in the old shock trauma down University Hospital. Almost killed me, right? So I've always been afraid of guns. So when he slammed that gun down on the table, I was like, oh, my God. I was scared to death. So now I'm talking to him, right? I'm like, Joe, come on, man. You shouldn't have that gun in my house and all that. He starts crying. He picks up the gun, takes it out, puts it in the trunk of his car, comes back in his house. We get to talking. He says, how come you didn't come out to the meeting last night? I said, man, because I told Sue I would be here when she called so I could talk to her. So we get to talking, everything squares off. He leaves. What's the first thing I do? What do they say in Narcotics Anonymous? Is when something happens, do what? Call your sponsor. I went straight and called Charlie. I said, child, you ain't gonna believe this. I was supposed to meet J Joe at the meeting last night. I didn't make it out there because of Sue. He said, if I don't help him, he's gonna kill me. What am I supposed to do? He said, I suggest you help his ass. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share.